Hey there friends, Dave Polite of Scan and Missing Project, a copyrighted edition for our video channel. And this is a Huck TV presentation. And that is Huck right there watching over what we're doing today. She's not in the room. She's outside playing right now. So uh, bless that little dog. So I am Dave Polite, Missing 411, Can and Missing Project, copyrighted edition for our video channel. And uh, this is a missing person video. So uh, this is our new documentary, number three. Yeah, I never thought I'd get to the third one. But this one is quite different than others you've seen in the past. Our first documentary, Missing 411, was about a series of missing kids who disappeared in the wild. Second one is essentially about a missing group of hunters. And this third one brings in a new element, UFOs. And uh, I think you're gonna be very intrigued by what I present to you, what uh, sheriffs have to say, etc. When we started off, we definitely weren't going this path and a couple of things got dropped in our lap. And I gotta tell you, I was as stunned as anybody when we decided to make a right-hand turn and go right after this. And uh, you're gonna like it. And the, uh, it premieres November 12th in Tempe, Arizona. The link to the premiere will be on the pinned number one comment under this video. <clears throat> the uh, premiere is gonna be something special, different than we've, what we've done in the past. This premiere will be obviously the movie. We're going to have a super nice catered meal. It's going to be at a really, really nice museum in Arizona. And they have an auditorium there that's perfect for the playing of the show. We'll take a little break, we'll reconvene, and then we're going to interview some people that are going to blow your socks off about what they have to say about this topic. And I'm literally, they will blow your socks off. So. There is not going to be a live feed on this. Uh, the movie will premiere November 15th to the public. And it'll be probably video on demand and will also be saw on DVDs. Exciting times ahead, folks. It's gonna really shake up this world. There are no this isn't footage that nobody's ever seen. This is all original footage that we put together for this. So, uh, thanks for hanging in there. Sales of tickets to the premiere have blown our socks off. So if you want to get a ticket, I suggest you do it soon. <clears throat> but this is the biggest auditorium we could find for doing something like this that really fit our needs. So it'll be a huge crowd compared to our first two premieres, which is pretty exciting to us. So onto the missing persons episode for today. And uh, by the way, all you villagers out there that make these comments, awesome, thank you. For the people out there that wanna make rude, crude, and obscene comments, you're gone. There's some people out there that are putting up uh, posts that have stolen our logo and they want you to go to a site don't don't do that now i've i've probably eliminated 90 percent of my big comments on 10 percent that it's a fraud they're trying to fraudulently misrepresent us trying to steal your money don't do it so away we go first letter hey dave i'll keep it short in your videos, you often tell us villagers that you appreciate us, etc. Well, I just want to say that us villagers appreciate you, respect you, enjoy your videos and books, and we all wish you the best. Thanks for shining a light on the missing 411 phenomenon and for bringing us all together as a community, a village of critical thinkers with shared interests. Take care of yourself, we, and we know we are all with you and support you. We laugh together, we cry together, we mourn and we miss Ben together, and we'll continue pushing forward together. Never give up and keep up the good work. A million thanks for everything you do. 
P.S. I am an expat living in Israel. If you need any help here or ever visit the Holy Land, I'm at your service. Well, thank you. Thanks for the kind words. I cannot tell you how impressed I am with the quality of posts and the kind nature that the people have here. Uh, I, I'm stunned. And I think everybody here realizes that many of us have depressing times in our lives. And the words that you express to others who post their times and the sympathy and the empathy you show, huge. And that's really what society should be about. And as long as we keep on that path, you make me a really happy person. So keep up the great work, village. Next post. Hey, Dave, thanks for giving us the opportunity to share our stories with you. You've been a father to many and an inspiration to all villagers. My sincere condolences about Ben, you're in my prayers always. I wanted to share an experience that happened to my husband and I a week ago in Homestead, Florida. It was in the night of Hurricane Ian and my wonderful adventurous husband decided it would be a great idea to drive through the feeder bands of the hurricane by our area. So we we're not directly impacted by it. So of course, being the great wife I am, I went with him. That's a good wife. <laughs> As we were driving through the rural areas to get there, there was a field to my right with crops 40 feet high. I could see the shadows of the trees, so I was able to more or less determine the height of the bushes. Well, as I was looking, I noticed several round balls of light floating in different directions in the field within the bushes. We had a category one hurricane conditions in our area during Ian. There was a lot of rain and strong winds. As I see the lights, I think to myself, there can't be anyone out there under these conditions in time and night. Who would possibly be out there? But upon a closer look, I noticed the lights were moving in directions that were impossible for a human to move. Too fast, too tall. Then I see one light come out of another and begin moving in all directions. There were four lights in total. I asked my husband what they were and he quickly disregarded and stated they were lights from a building in the area. Yeah, okay. <laughs> That's what she wrote. I agree. I said, no, honey, that was not a building, but left, but left it as it is, since I knew we had to come back through the same street. So I waited until we returned to see if the lights were still there. At 11.30 p.m., to my amazement, we came back through the area and the lights were still there. I called out to my husband to look, and he literally immediately stopped the car. He rolled down the window and stared for about two minutes. We were shocked. Okay, now you got him. Good job. Honestly, I was terrified since I know a little more about these orbs through your videos, books, and other listeners' stories. I asked him to get the hell out of there, so he pressed on the gas and we left. Wish I would have taken a video. Yeah, you got your camera, take the video. The next morning, my husband told me he couldn't sleep after seeing the lights, so he went back at 4 a.m. to see if the lights were still there while I was sleeping. Ooh, not smart, not smart. He said they were my, migrant workers working in the field, laughing out, LOL. Does he expect me to believe this? During a hurricane, winds of at least 70 miles per hour, torrential rain and lights moving faster than the speed of light throughout a field in different directions over eight hours? I do not think so. I know lighting can play with our vision, but I know what I saw. I saw these lights moving in different directions, sometimes way higher than the tree line, and moving so quickly it would be humanly impossible to do so. And yeah, I just want to share my story. Hugs for hucks. Thanks for listening. So there's two words for that. Cognitive dissonance. I believe you 100%. No, there's not going to be any migrants working in the field. 70 mile per hour winds. Lights going all in a different direction. No. And you know what? Your husband knows that. And the reality is he can't. He can't come to that reality in his mind and be comfortable. So he, have to, he has to put it in a box up here and say, okay, this is what it is. I can sleep tonight. I can go home. Remember, he couldn't sleep. So now he can sleep knowing that, oh, it's just migrants picking berries. A lot of those people in the world, and I've learned over time 
that with them it's a slow feed. They'll get there, but it's going to take a long, longer period of time than most. And if you get him there too quickly, they'll just shut you down. Like he had to go back alone. And he had to go through it, the steps by himself. Don't get frustrated with him. Next letter. I wasn't going to waste my time writing into the wind, but now I know you'll read this, so here's a story. I live in hot and sunny Chandler, Arizona. <clears throat> in 2007, I became friends with an old girlfriend I hadn't seen in 13-ish years. I was 22, she was 19 when we dated. 13 years later, and she had served in the Army, gotten two master's degrees and a bachelor or two, mathematic and science-based studies. She was currently at the time going for a PhD in physics and chemistry. I can't remember, at a university in Southeast US state, but her passion was photography. She was a six foot two redhead from Holland, spoke five languages, wow. Angry, depressed, and suicidal, wow. I've included that information because she hits a few 411 buckets, albeit this is not a 411 case, but smells like it. They may almost could have been. Around 2009, she called me to say she was killing herself. I called her local law enforcement three time zones away and they got her in time. Because I did that, she was furious with me and didn't answer my weekly, are you okay, calls for months. But eventually she did. We became friends again. Good. It was about two years later, 2011 or so. She'd walked away from everything, moved to Seattle to follow her passion. She was a full bore photographer. Her depression was creeping back in and needed a change. What's the opposite of Seattle? In 2012, she decided to give Arizona another go. I still lived here and had a bunch of friends who I thought she'd get along with. Help her get out of her funk by getting out and doing stuff. Packed everything up and took her time driving down, stopping to take a few pictures here and there. When she got down here and got settled in, she uploaded them to her Mac. She went through all of them. Kept the good ones, edited some, make a calendar, sell the prints, random pictures transitioning from the rainforest to the desert. Somewhere in Northern California, in 2012 at a rest stop, one night she took this random picture in the woods told me she found something in one of her pictures and e emailed me the pictures. I'm e emailing them to you. We call it the demon. And I've got the pictures for you. So, <clears throat> this is the first picture that was sent. Now, I'll, I'll be it, this is a tough one. Tough one to see anything. Pillar here, some trees here really can't see anything. So then we go to picture number two that he sent. This is a close-up of the other picture. Remember I told you the tree. Well, we're starting to get the idea here. Something weird is going on. Focus right there. See the two eyes. You with me? Now, this is a bigger close-up of that same picture. Two eyes, shoulder, shoulder, head, two eyes. It almost looks like this thing has pointy type ears, like a demon. Very strange picture. To me, this is the best one. <clears throat> this almost looks like it's in some kind of pit in the ground. And this is some kind of brick wall. And he's almost up to his chest plate in here. But glowing eyes for sure. There's some pretty interesting pictures. I like them, that's why I printed them for you. <coughs> Back to the story. 10 years ago, she told me to never show anyone these pictures. I've not told you her name, so she remains anonymous. In 2014, we had a falling out and haven't spoken again until recently. I've since gotten into Bigfoot stuff and I've seen a lot of pictures. Never seen anything like the demon. In July of this year, 2022, I sent her a text message letting her know I was planning on reaching out to cryptozoologists about the demon. I 
I feel it's self-centered to keep it from those that could help. No one will know who she is. The EXIF data will reflect my information. She blew me off, said she was at work and was busy, didn't know what I was talking about. Bye. So I chewed on it for three months. I never called back and she's never said anything to me since. I've never seen anything like this, Dave, and it scares the hell out of me. Please don't release any of her information, but I'll give it to you so she can reach out to her if you like. I've never released her information. No names, no nothing. I may have provided a little too much info about her background, but so be it. She's still around. I pray she's gotten help with her internal demon. Thanks for listening. Well, what do you think? Don't think it's Bigfoot. Could, could be some other kind of cryptid creature. I've never seen pointing ears on a Bigfoot. Usually the ears are very, very small and subtle. But uh, glowing eyes I've heard of before. Don't know. It's a good one though. Next letter. Hey Dave, I'm going to try to make this as short as I can because I know how precious your time is. So, before I go on, I get a lot of letters. A lot of letters. If I get a whole page with no paragraphs, I'm not even reading it. It's too hard to read. Spend some time going through it, breaking it up so there's breaks there. Punctuation, etc. So it makes it easier on me. I've been sober for almost five years now from alcohol and drugs, and in that time my spiritual outlook has evolved into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Congratulations. When I was in active addiction, I was as far distant from God's love as possible. I suffered from unbearable sleep paralysis in which I had physical proof of attacks from the shadow demons. It climaxed when the biggest demon jumped on top of me and began choking me because I would commit suicide like it commanded me to do so. I began to call out Jesus' name because I knew I had no hope of surviving other than with him. Because I was in sleep paralysis, that was extremely hard to do, but eventually I managed to get the demon to leave me. When I ran to the bathroom to look at my neck, I woke up my mom with my scrambling. She was shocked and scared by the marks around my neck that showed a four-finger hand twice the size of mine. I was blessed by my priest and got sober and since have never experienced this phenomenon again. Awesome. Now onto the truly special story I want to share with you. Friends, this one is good. Two weeks ago, I got home from work and took my dog for her nightly walk. She did her thing and I knew she was good for the night. About an hour later, my 16-year-old poodle terrier mix named Snooky began to bark and paw at me that she needed to go outside. I knew she didn't, so I blew her off. She became more and more agitated until I finally broke down 10 minutes later and took her out. Since our last walk, it, has, it had began to rain. And when it was raining, my dog refuses to go out for a walk. I, I've had some dogs like that. I thought once she saw it was raining, she would calm down. And once for all, I was wrong. When she stepped outside, she began to hurriedly pull me down the street despite the rain. I couldn't understand it. My dog doesn't walk in the rain. Not only that, but she was pulling me so fast as in, and was in such a hurry, she never stopped once to sniff, which always made me wonder what was up. Why was she so obsessed? As we turned the corner five blocks away, we came upon a homeless man robbing a guy lying on the ground. I knocked the homeless guy off the man on the ground and called 911 because the guy was unconscious. Thank you, sir for stepping in and being a great citizen. After talking to the operator, I noticed the guy's lips were blue and I saw he wasn't breathing. Then I saw a used syringe under the car he was next to. It didn't take me long to figure out this guy overdosed as he was getting out of the car. I immediately began to do mouth to mouth and give chest compressions until I finally got him barely breathing by the time ambulance got there. They hit him twice with Narcan before he came to. The one medic told me I saved the guy's life. I humbly told her I didn't save him, that it was my dog Snooky who was the hero. The medic was amazed by the story, and as she was walking away, I ran up to her and gave her my name and number to give to the man 
so that if he wanted to help getting sober, I was willing to help him. Now that is a great gesture right there. You made it, but now you can help others because of the history and experience you have. As a dog owner, you know your dog's behavior. For my dog to want to go out in the rain and not stop to sniff even once is beyond me. She took me right to the overdose man. In my humble opinion, Dave, I cannot contribute anything other than the intervention of God to this story. Thank you so much for all you do, Dave, in exposing the unexplained and unexplainable phenomena that goes on in this world. I think we are truly unaware of the wider reality of it, its existence. Have a wonderful day and give Huck a rub for me. <clears throat> and he sent a picture to Snooky. And if there's ever a time, I'm going to put somebody's picture up. This dog deserves a medal. Snooky, you are awesome. I'm going to go show it to Huck later and see if she gives you a lick. You know, what could it be other than God? I mean, the dog was five blocks away from this person dying. And then some people would say, well, you know... It was just a fluke, and the dog just happened to find... No, I don't buy that. Not five, six blocks away. Not in the rain. Something was up. I hope that person that you saved will contact you. Next letter. Hey, Dave. I know you can't read all the letters, but I hope you get this message. Anyway, I've read the high concentrations of GHB can cause the body to not be able to regulate its internal temperature. It can cause amnesia, coma, hypothermia, hallucinations, and even death. All true. And for the people with a background, in the book, Missing, Missing 411, A Sobering Coincidence, I wrote about a series of young men who disappeared and were found in bodies of water. In one case, the coroner came back and said a bunch of hocus pocus and he, the boy, the young man drowned. That's what they said. Parents didn't believe it. They went out and they got a secondary autopsy. And in that secondary autopsy, they tested for, I think, 100 different drugs, whereas the coroner only tests for 24. It's the same everywhere. It costs a lot of money to test for these. And so they figure the top 24 are most conventional and that's what they go for. Well, in the secondary autopsy, in several of these cases, they found super high levels of GHB that couldn't be explained to be in the body. And just so you know, the body does manufacture GHB in minute quantities. And the question I've always asked, has somehow, somewhere, someone learned to turn that faucet on in our body? I don't know. So it would seem that it would explain quite a bit about what occurs in your research, missing clothing, unexplained death, amnesia, what sounds like possible hallucinations when people are actually found, and try to explain what they think happened. We know that ETs have the ability to control with the minds. So one would assume they could make your body produce a bunch of its own chemicals to make it easier for testing, perhaps. And the bonus is why is they wouldn't remember anything. I also wanted to mention that I've had this really odd recurring dream since I was about three years old. I've never made any sense of it until I started reading your books and paying attention to the research. It could mean nothing, but who knows? I've had a lot of odd experiences in my life, so maybe there's something to it. In my dream, I'm always in the woods walking down the creek or near a pond. When I walk to a certain area of the water, there are small bubbles, almost like bubbling acid or something. And then there's an odd smell to the water. Parentheses, I would like to add, I have never smelled anything in my dream except these ones. End of parentheses. And when I go to touch the water, it's almost like electricity flowing through my body. And it's like it's sucking my energy or something. Like it's trying to put me to sleep or drag me into the ground. I know this all sounds weird, but to me it almost sounds like maybe there's something with the water that causes these people to die or fall asleep or drown in the water. The smell, the best I can describe, is like opening a bottle of aspirin. I hope maybe you can gather something out of this. If you have any other questions about my experiences there that are not in this email, let me know. I appreciate all your work. Thanks for what you're doing. 
Never heard anything quite like that. That's why I read the stories. Maybe it'll unleash, unlock a memory in somebody out there. Next one, Dave. For a number of years, I've heard it explained that when food is placed as bait for the Sasquatch and the camera fails to record any activity, but the food seemingly disappears, it may be that the Sasquatch is able to control time and space in order to get the food without being recorded. The question would be, why do I need to get food this way if I can control space and time? If I can control space and time, why would I even need food? It would be pointless. If these beings are that smart, that advanced, they could enter any shopping center anytime they like and pick out the choice food without ever being caught. They would not be picking apples from a tree branches. Again, if these beings can control space and time, they would simply go back in time 10,000 years and pick up a few aurochs to reestablish the original cattle lines. But instead, we have multitudes of cattle mutilations that draw unwanted attention if these beings care about anonymity. They, do not, they don't ask permission. They don't explain their purpose. They don't care what damage they cause the rancher. They waste what they touch. A missing part of an animal does not mean it is important to the beings, who supposedly are so very advanced, yet can't even be bothered to act any differently than other predators who kill, destroy, and waste. Their activity seems more like a diversion or a distraction. Let me stop there. He made it a point in here in saying that they waste the animal. What if that animal is poisonous to us at some level? What if they're saving our life? What if they've tested that animal or an entire herd earlier and now they're coming back to take out the ones that are bad? You gotta think outside the box. Humanizing the principles, conduct, or practice of something not human is unwise even if these beings seem advanced beyond our understanding. The one thing that makes man stand out is love. I do not claim that many of mankind's Many of mankind understand what love is, but it is not in any way evident in these various beings' activities. Thanks, David. It's good to see you with a smile and a heart of love still for Ben and what is right and good. May you have many more smiles. Thank you. Some days aren't a lot of smiles. Okay, next letter. I rewatched your recent September 11th, 2022 YouTube video with discussion of the Indian Lake region of the Adirondacks in upstate New York. I believe you would find this particularly obscure article of note. I've read a couple of your books, Eastern U.S. and Hunters, and I've watched both your movies. I applaud you for your research and commitment to it. It is clear that you are truly passionate about the work you do. It also shows you have a great courage to conduct it, especially with your law enforcement background. I am a New York State trooper, and my experience is that law enforcement community as a whole generally doesn't bear a reputation for open-minded free thinking or discussion of fringe topics. You are right, sir. <laughs> I think I've told you that in my high school class, I think there were 500 of us, uh, 12 became sheriffs or police officers. And we're all pretty, pretty close. Of those 12, only one of them really follows my work. And one of them is actually going to be at the premiere. So, but that's okay. I don't want to force feed it to anybody. If they want to walk around with blinders on, that's fine with me. And he goes on. But there are still some of us every so often who subscribe to the great quote, Minds are like parachutes. They work best when open. Ka-ching. Thanks for that. <laughs> to give you some background, I grew up in Hamilton County, New York, the same county Indian Lake is located. Many years ago, I participated in a search with New York State DEC while on a search team 5-1 for a missing person, Jack Coloni, who disappeared from within the Cedar River flow, Moose River Plains of Indian Lake, which happens to have a large body of water which happens to be a story I've written about. I remember from the search how bloodhounds, helicopters, and days of searching yield absolutely nothing. I also remember how Colony's campsite with picnic tables set, 
his vehicle and everything else was set up like he just vanished into thin air and it, don't, and it has always struck with me, stuck with me. Many years later, when I worked at the Indian Lake area as a state trooper, I noticed that one of the locals had a metal UFO sculpture in his front yard visible from Route 30. I thought it was odd, especially given the number of missing people from the surrounding area, and I began to search around for what the backstory was. The search led me to this article. The incident described in this article occurred in the same camping area as Jack, but many years before. I checked with a few Hamilton County Sheriff's Department dispatchers, longtime Hamilton County residents, and they confirmed that they knew the trooper in the article and the forest ranger. Don't mind the email. It says it's from blankety blank. When you're in law enforcement, you tend to be privacy oriented and don't always want your name out there with an email account. If you have any questions or you'd like more info, I can always provide my phone number and send you an email from my work account to verify my employment. I'm not going to say who it was. Anyhow, the story was the incident at Indian Lake. And what it's about was a group of campers there that saw a series of UFOs over Indian Lake at night. I've known about it for a long time. It's a really good story. Look it up online. The incident at Indian Lake. It's a good one. And uh, Mr. State Trooper, thanks for sending that in. I appreciate it. Keep in touch. And believe it or not, there's a lot of law enforcement guys and ladies that watch this. And I get emails from them all the time. Dispatchers, paramedics, and uh, even National Forest Park Rangers. Yes, I won't give you up, but I, I appreciate your notes and your support and your honesty about your organization. And then uh, there's several of you out there that know that the National Park Service isn't the most transparent group in the world. I'll leave it at that. So, the first case, it's an interesting one to me. The man's name was Con Van Alstein. Con, C-O-N, Van Alstein. Didn't know the age, but he went missing November 25th, 1921. And he'd been a 30-year-old prospector on the Alaska-Yukon border. Uh, he went missing in an area called Eagle, Alaska, right on the border. And he was working in an area called Mission Creek. Let me show you a map of the area here. It's a pretty famous place, Dawson City, in the Yukon. And then this is the border, Yukon and Alaska. And this is Mission Creek. Eagle's right on the border. Mission Creek is up in this area and goes way back up into here. Very remote areas. Dawson City, interesting place. If you ever can get by there, get by there. There's some interesting stories about drinks in the bar. That's all I'll say to you. So, uh, in late April 1921, people saw Khan come down into the city and pick up supplies. It's the last time he was seen. Well, he was all famous throughout the Yukon and Alaska. And he was the first man to make a claim in El Dorado at Klondike Mine number 16. And at the time, he believed when he staked that claim that it was a marginal producing one. Well, he was wrong. Uh, he met a man named Thomas Lippy, and Thomas and him decided that they would switch claims. He'd take Thomas's, Thomas's would take him. Well, Mr. Lippy went on to mine two million dollars worth of gold uh, in the 19, late 1918, 1920, and 21 out of that mine. Two million dollars at that point was huge. And Mr. Lippy retired into Seattle, a very wealthy man. And Van Austin married very little on that mine that was switched over from Mr. Lippy. Well, Khan's friends reported him missing in July of 1921. 
He was supposedly supposed to come in for food in June and didn't. So they got a hold of the U.S. Marshal in uh, Eagle named J.D. Powers. Now, why would they have a U.S. Marshal there? Well, this was one of the main crossing points from the Yukon into Alaska. So the U.S. government put a lone U.S. Marshal in this wild area. 1921, wild doesn't fit that area. It was really wild. Um, and then the place where Con on Mission Creek had his camp and mine was really wild. And even today, in the upper reaches of Mission Creek, it's really wild. So JD, the marshal, decides to work his way up Mission Creek and see what he can find. So late in September 1921, he hiked into Mission Creek and he hiked and he hiked and he hiked and he hiked and he got to a place that was, in his words, extremely remote that nobody would stumble onto. And he found JD's camp where he was mining the creek. So he had a sluice box, etc. And they found a camp tent. In the tent, they found his watch his rifle, his pocketbook, and a series of personal belongings. Now, let me tell you, folks, when you're in remote areas like that, Yukon or Alaska, you don't go anywhere of distance without your rifle. Why? Because they've got big bears out there. And at that point in 1921, there probably weren't any pistols big enough to kill a bear with one shot. So he needed his rifle. Well, JD noted in his reports that the bear tore up the camp. A couple of bears tore up the camp really bad and were going after the food that was available. And they found a calendar in his camp with the last date that was crossed out was June 8th, 1921. So he was in there in September, so it had been a couple months. So he searched out for a radius for quite a distance. He didn't say how far, but it was quite a distance. And he was looking for a body. He was looking for some evidence of a crime, uh, drag marks. Uh, if there was depredation, maybe bones, pieces of clothing, he didn't find anything. So he said that he didn't believe that a crime occurred. He f and in the report it says that he felt that he left camp momentarily. So why would you momentarily leave camp? Go to the bathroom? Get some water out of the creek? Maybe? but he didn't find any tracks. And in the end, JD said that he couldn't find an explanation for the disappearance. Now again, Khan was a noted figure in the Yukon and Alaska for staking that Klondike mine number 16. And he was just scraping by an existence in, in the manner that he was now. He was never found. And that area got a reputation of being pretty spooky. I could tell you that going up into an area like a creek can be pretty dangerous in, in an area like that because the creek and the sounds of the creek will muffle sounds of things in the bush. And you got to have all your senses with you when you're walking around out here. I've stated a hundred times, and I'll say it a hundred and one. You are nuts to hike in the woods with headphones on. You are nuts. You're in the woods for the experience, for the beauty. Part of that beauty is listening to birds, animals. Out here, we have the elk rut and we have the deer rut, and it's going on right now. And they make noises, and if you walk into an elk, or a moose, or a deer, and they come towards you, you're dead, if they want to kill you. 
That's right. So use all your senses. Get those headphones off you and those earphones off you. Please. So that was Con Van Alstine. Next case. And this one hit really close to home. Mrs. George McComish. Unknown age. She was the wife of a farmer rancher. She went missing August 17th, 1941, 23 miles north of Kingston, Ontario. I'll show you where this happened. So this is a map, US, Canadian border. This is New York. And this is Clear Lake where the incident happened. This is Kingston. I've wrote about disappearances all throughout this area before. There's a lot of weird ones. A lot of very weird ones. Now, Ms. McComish went out looking for a small herd of cattle that she hadn't seen in several days. So, she went out looking for them in a very desolate area. This part of Clear Lake, not a lot of people in 1941, still not a lot of people today. This is near a place called Hardwood Bay in Clear Lake. Well, the next day, neighbors realized she was missing. Her husband was out of town and they searched for her for a day, couldn't find her and they called the provisional or the provincial police. They responded. Well, the police brought in dogs and they tracked her deep into the bush and they said the tracks suddenly stopped. How can that be? How can they suddenly stop? They said every night that she'd been missing had been bitterly cold. Kind of weird for August. So what the police did is they ordered Clear Lake dragged because there was a part in the grass where they thought that there was a, a drag mark or a skid mark where she maybe went into the water. Well, they dragged the lake for two days, they didn't find anything. So after not finding anything, on August 21st, four days after she disappeared, the provincial police said that they'd given up all hope of finding her alive. As a side note, her body never surfaced in Clear Lake. She was never found. Let me tell you this. This is about the 10th case that I've written about and told you about where somebody disappears looking for lost cattle. Now, isn't that weird? When you start looking back on cattle mutilation cases, and then you have people going out to look for cattle and the people disappear and they're never found. What are you supposed to think? There's Huck out there mad that I'm not cuddling with her, scratching her belly, playing ball. She's so selfish. <laughs> uh, anyhow, lots of cases, people looking for cattle, never found. Take it to the bank. Next case involves a man named Glenn Carr, C-A-R-R, -R, 40 years old, missing October 25th, 1984. He was a California resident. Yes, California resident, formerly lived in Libby, Montana. You know Libby very well. Fished up there. It's right near the Idaho border. Lily, Libby is known as a super fun site. It's an area where they've mined asbestos and the asbestos has gone airborne and the entire community in Libya had been infected at that time. And the government said oh, that they were on the hook for a lot of the damages and medical conditions and things. So the, the super fun site still isn't cleaned up 100%. So we don't spend a lot of time in Libya. But Glenn had uh, lived in California and friends invited him out to Montana to hunt the spotted bear area. He said, sure, 
Well, they established a camp uh, on October 20, correct that, yes, October 23rd. And they, and they started to hunt late in that day. He made it back to camp. Everyone hung out. And October 24th, all the hunters left on horseback. And at one point, Glenn got off the horse and started looking for tracks in an area. Typical, if you're a good hunter, you're looking for tracks. He had his horse tied up. And he was walking and walking and walking and one thing led to another and he had walked a long ways from the horse and he knew exactly where he was so he just walked back to camp and said yeah i'll get the horse in the morning it was a big horse and we have some huge horses here in montana that the bears will not mess with so he arrived late ate dinner said he was going to get up early and go get the horse the next morning november 25th or october 25th he rose early and he told his friends he'd be back and uh, he was going to get the horse. He thought it was about a 30 minute trip out. Now the camp was very near the Spotted Bear Ranger Station. And I'll tell you about that in a second. I'll show you a map. Well, late on the 25th, Glenn hadn't returned. And the only communication in the area was at the Diamond R Ranch, which had communication system. So his hunter bunnies went to the Diamond R and they contacted the Flathead County Sheriff. And Sheriff Chuck Rhodes came out and started the search procedure. And about the time they started searching, wind and snow hit the area. And over the next couple days, they got four to eight feet of snow. So let me give you this map here. If you have watched my videos in the recent past, I did one the other day and on a news segment where I was at the head of Hungry Horse Reservoir up in this area looking south. Hungry Horse Reservoir ends right here. This is the south fork of the Flathead that flows into the reservoir. Diamond R Ranch is right here. Their camp was right here. And this is a place called the Spotted Bear Lookout. So. The friends stated that Glenn was one of the most experienced, level-headed, mindful hunters they'd ever met. And when he told them that it was a 30-minute walk to get the horse, he said, no problem, he'll be back soon. Well, Rhodes, the sheriff, put 20 men into the field, and immediately they're hit with these big snowstorms of four to eight feet of snowdrifts. The sheriff came back, talked to the friend some more, and said, well, how, how much risk-taking would Glenn do? And his friend said, almost none. Which is why he came back to camp the night before without pushing himself to go back and get his horse. They said that when he left, he had a handgun and warm clothes. On October 31st, so remember, he disappeared on October 25th. Six days later, the Flathead County Sheriff flew the area and they found Glenn's horse tied to a tree in a place called No Name Creek. Now, the newspaper said that past searchers had gone into this exact area and never heard the horse and never saw the horse. Pretty weird. Multiple canine teams were dispatched into this area. They found nothing. They did say that they found some tracks which might have been Glenn's on a path towards Spotted Bear Lookout, which makes no sense at all. Glenn knew the area. You have to hike uphill to get to the lookout. The camp was downhill. Again, I'm going to give this to you. The lookout is on Spotted Bear Mountain right here. He's hunting in this area. The camp was down low here. And this is the river. Everything flows in this area downhill to the river. You can't get lost here, friends. You cannot get lost. I have been to this exact area 
five times. Again, I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer. But somebody as experienced as Glenn Carr was not going to get lost. So multiple canine searches, dozens of friends and Flathead County Sheriff's seven day search and rescue, they found nothing. And they went through the list. They thought that it was very unlikely that any grizzly bear would be out that late in the season with the snow hitting. They didn't think so. And then they also talked about mountain lions. There's some big mountain lions out there, like over 200 pounds, big. But the thing is, is that if somebody is attacked by one of these, it's going to be a bloody scene in the snow. You won't be able to miss it. And they didn't find anything. So let me explain something. This right here, right here, is a spotted bear river. About three years ago, Angie and I met a guy that was hunting up in this area, and we started talking to him. And we were saying, hey, there are big bears up here. We've heard there are, but how big really are they? And he goes, oh, you have a minute? And I said, sure. So he sit there, and he shows us a video that he took with his phone. He's sitting in a truck driving up that road and coming down the road is honestly the one of the biggest grizzly bear I've ever seen in my life. He's driving up the road. The grizzly bear is coming down the road. <coughs> the grizzly bear doesn't give two hucks about that car. It's not moving. It's coming right down the middle of the road. And I'm looking at this thing coming down the road. It looks like another truck. Honestly, his guess, and he was a guide, that that bear weighed 1,200 pounds. My guess is it weighed 1,200 pounds. It walked right by the truck. He stopped right by the driver's door. Didn't look at him. He knew he was the toughest thing on that mountain. If I would have seen that thing on a hiking trail, I would have prayed to God that I got out of there all right because that bear was the biggest bear I've ever seen in the wild. And I didn't see it in the wild, I saw it on a video, but it was on that road. So are there big bears there? No, there's huge bears there. So, and that was in the spotted bear wilderness. And then the area where Glenn disappeared, just a little bit further south, is where it even gets more wild because there's no roads, there's nothing. And, uh, yeah, but they did a seven day search and they couldn't find Glenn. The sheriff was asked for an explanation about how they could find the horse. But they couldn't find him. The sheriff had no explanation. Now, does this case sound kind of familiar to you? Remember in past cases I've talked to you about a case in Alaska where a man was coming back to camp, left his food, left what he killed in a backpack, said he'd come back the next morning, slept, went back the next day, disappeared, food was never touched. Eerily familiar circumstances. That was, I told you about that case maybe a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, on this channel. You can go back and watch it. The point is, point of separation. He's with all those hunters and he separates and something happens. Now, does that mean that while he's with the horse, he's safe? I don't know. It's very odd. Uh, remember I told you that some of the horses you see up here are what's called draft horses. And they're huge. Angie and I went on a ride at the beginning of summer, and we were on some. And they're like gentle giants. And the guides we were with, we asked them, I said, hey, what do these horses act like when they see a bear? He goes, oh, they don't give two hucks. They just 
look at the bear. The bear looks at them and says, I don't want anything to do with that horse, and moves on. I said, oh, that's comforting. <laughs> I don't want to be on this horse and it to turn and run like uh, a stallion. He goes, nah, they don't do that. So had a nice calm ride. But uh, yeah, draft horses. They're big up here. And uh, it's almost a guarantee that that's what Glenn had. And that's why he felt safe just leaving it tied to a tree for the night. But it is interesting that flyover by air finds the horse, but the guys on the ground walked right by it, didn't see it. And the horse didn't make any noise, which is really weird. So there's three cases and some really good stories and some really good pictures. So I appreciate you guys sending those in. Um, again, this, this documentary is going to shake up the UFO world and the hunting world. I guarantee it. Some people have said, oh, that UFO in that picture, Dave, over your shoulder is really a, a super secret government spy plane. Great. Great. Because once you understand how this plays into everything I'm explaining, you won't believe it. So, hope you can make the premiere. If you can't, Tempe, Arizona, November 12th. If you can't, then uh, the movie will be released November 15th, probably on several platforms. It's like every other documentary. I don't have the horsepower to get it into theaters and Honestly, I don't know if I have the willpower or the energy to work it that much harder. Normal documentary has taken us 12 to 14 months. This is three plus years. Everything imaginable that could happen has happened. So there's a lot of bad karma around this film. And it, a lot of people who have been intimately involved have said, Dave, it's like certain entities do not want this to come out. Maybe. Very odd. Very odd. So, before I go, today I was at the store and there were a couple of really old people in front of me. And this one older lady was having a real tough time getting through this door. She was ahead of me. So I jumped around everybody, held the door open, helped her out with the cart. And she looked at me and she said, wow, thank you, sir. Now she's probably, I don't know, 20 years older than me. Well, thank you, sir. I said, no, thank you. I said, uh, if I could help you, I will. And boy, that lady had the biggest smile in the world. And those little acts of kindness go so many miles towards fueling your soul. You see, I know you guys and ladies out there do those kind of things. And really as a society in these tough times where some people give you a dirty look and we have political divisions, being nice doesn't cost you anything. Thanks for being here. I'm humbled that anyone watches this show. If you can share this on your social media, I'd be very blessed. The information about our website, about our documentaries, about our online store are going to be listed on the first comment under this movie. You can go down there and watch them and read all the comments from all of you. So thanks for being here. Hopefully Huck will be back soon. I heard her in the background barking. You have a great day. Politeness out.